To my guests and me, it's Wednesday, July 11th, 2012, but whenever it is you're listening, hello and thank you so much for tuning in to another The Apologetics podcast debate, this time dealing with the future of the people and nation of Israel. The Narrow Path is the radio and internet ministry of Steve Gregg. Steve has hundreds of recorded lectures on verse-by-verse teachings of the scriptures and on a variety of topics. He runs the New Great Commission School, a non-accredited Bible and discipleship school, stressing an honest and intelligent approach to the Word of God. And he edited the book, Revelation Four Views, a parallel commentary, a signed copy of which I'm thankful to say I have in my library. Thank you, Steve, for joining us today. I appreciate being invited. Thank you. Dr. Michael Brown is the host of the daily, nationally syndicated talk radio show, The Line of Fire, as well as the Jewish outreach documentary TV series, Think It Through. He's the author of a number of books, including Our Hands Are Stained with Blood, The Tragic Story of the Church and the Jewish People, as well as Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, and most recently, The Real Kosher Jesus. Thanks so much for being here today, Dr. Brown. Glad to be with you, Chris. Now, today's debate is going to be a bit brief and somewhat informal because of the hectic schedules of my guests. Uh, It will, however, center around a debate thesis, which is this. There are no biblical promises awaiting fulfillment in the nation or ethnic descendants of Israel. Steve will begin with a seven and a half minute opening statement affirming the proposition, and Dr. Brown will have seven and a half minutes to open in denying it. And then we'll have about 30 minutes of informal conversation between the two, in which I'll periodically ask questions to keep the conversation on track and moving forward. And then after that, Dr. Brown will give his five minute closing statement, and Steve will finish things off with his five minute closing. So with that brief introduction out of the way, I'm going to open us in a little bit of prayer, and then we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for my guests being able to join me today and for the opportunity to dive together into your word, to try and understand what it is that you've said concerning the future of the people and nation of Israel. Please guide us, reveal the truth to us and to those listening, and help us to be respectful and loving to one another, even in areas in which we disagree. May we glorify you today, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So. Uh, Steve, if you're ready to go, I'll uh, begin your seven and a half minutes as soon as you begin speaking. All right. Well, uh, the proposition we're debating, supposedly, is uh, that there are no biblical promises awaiting fulfillment in the nation or ethnic descendants of Israel. Uh, on the face of it, that's a negative proposition, and yet I'm taking the positive position about it. It's kind of awkward. I uh, the, the same proposition could be restated in a positive way, which is Christ has fulfilled all the biblical promises to Israel. Now, that would be another way of saying there don't remain any more that are unfulfilled, and that would be my position. It's not so much a negative approach toward Israel as it is a positive approach toward Jesus Christ and what he accomplished. Uh, The idea is that God had a plan forever to bring Jesus Christ into the world and to redeem humanity. And he chose the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, and Abraham's family in particular, uh, to be, or maybe we should put that the other way around, Abraham's family and the nation of Israel in particular, to, uh, to be the agency through which he would bring the Messiah into the world. In the course of doing so, he promised Israel many blessings, uh, conditional blessings. You know, he gave them his law and he gave them uh, uh, promises that if they would keep his laws and keep his covenant, that they would experience special blessings that other nations would not experience and that he would use them for the mission of greatest significance in world history, which would be to bring salvation to the world, to the Gentiles. And this would be accomplished uh, through bringing the Messiah into the world. Even Jesus affirmed this when he's speaking to the woman at the well, when he said salvation is of the Jews. And certainly it has been so. God has uh, preserved the Jewish nation through the Old Testament period uh, sufficiently to bring forth the Messiah. And, of course, as Jesus uh, indicated in his ministry, that he was sent first and uh, initially, uniquely, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Although it was possible for a Gentile who had exceptional faith to get a blessing, uh, just as it was in the Old Testament, but... Christ's mission was essentially to the lost sheep of the house of Israel initially, and so was that of the apostles, as we see in the book of Acts. And even Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, saw it as his mission where he said in Acts chapter 13, it was necessary that the gospel first be preached to you, speaking to the Jews in the synagogue. Uh, But now he says we're going to go turn to the Gentiles. So, So we see that Israel always had priority throughout the Old Testament and the early period of the the New Testament. And that is because 
they had been God's special agent chosen to bring forth the Messiah, which has happened. Now, uh, the question, of course, of now that the Messiah has come, does Israel continue to have an ethnic uh, special status with God? Seems to be answered in the New Testament by statements. Uh, we see them especially by Paul and some by Peter. Uh, how that it would appear that people who are in Christ are the new Israel. And this is not, although people sometimes call this replacement theology, and, and it can be called that with some legitimacy, uh, it's not so much a replacement as it is a fulfillment. The idea being that God made certain promises to Israel, and he fulfilled them in Christ. Christ himself is the new Israel. And I believe in Scripture, in the Old Testament, Israel was represented uh, as a type of Christ. We see this, I think, especially in places like the Isaianic uh, servant of Yahweh passages, you know, the, the servant songs of Isaiah, where initially we see that Israel is the servant of Yahweh, as in Isaiah 44.1, where God says, Yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I've chosen. Jacob, my servant, chosen. Uh, Israel was the chosen servant of Yahweh. But as we study the Isaiahic passages on the servant of Yahweh, we find that the servant of Yahweh kind of morphs into the messianic figure, so that in the New Testament, um, most of the servant passages are quoted as if they belong to Jesus. And, and it's always confused a lot of people. You know, how is it that the servant of Yahweh seems to be Israel in some places and Jesus in other places? And I believe it's not really that confusing. I believe that Israel was a type of the Messiah. And I think the, the early church saw it that way, too. That's why Matthew could quote from Hosea 11.1, 1, Out of Egypt I've called my son. A statement which in Hosea is not even a prophecy, but a, a historical recollection of the Exodus. And Matthew can apply it to Jesus coming out of Egypt as a baby. Because I believe that early Christians saw Jesus himself as the antitype or the fulfillment of what Israel represented. And now, those who are of ethnic Israel, I believe, stand on exactly the same footing before God as does a non-Israelite, in that uh, there's no Jew or Gentile in Christ, and I don't really believe there's Jew or Gentile outside of Christ. I believe that God is not a racist. He doesn't judge people or evaluate them based on who their ancestors are. He, he judges everyone according to their own heart. Even as he said to Eli back in 1 Samuel chapter 2, he says he said to Eli's family, the priest, I, he said, I verily said that you're family would walk before me forever, but he says, those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me should be lightly esteemed. And I think that's true no matter what ethnic nation a person belongs to. If someone honors God, he honors them. If they despise him, they're lightly esteemed. I don't think God takes their race into consideration. As far as specific promises that remain to be fulfilled to people who are ethnic Jews, I would have to see them. Uh, I say there are none. But, of course, to make a universal negative can easily be disproven by somebody showing that there are some. And so I'd be glad to see that. But as I understand it, Paul's interpretation is that the promises made to Abraham and his seed are fulfilled to one seed, Jesus Christ. And those who are in Christ are his seed and the heirs according to the promise, according to Galatians chapter 3. So that would be my thesis in a, in a nutshell. I probably left myself a little. <laughs> That's okay, Steve. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Brown appreciates a, a little bit of uh, brevity. Uh, Dr. Brown, so now if uh, you're ready to begin, I'll start your seven and a half timer as soon as you begin. All right, Steve, I appreciate the presentation and agree with much of it and categorically differ with other parts, and I'm happy to demonstrate why. Um, this has nothing to do with racism. This has nothing to do with God looking at one ethnic group with superiority over another. It simply has to do with the trustworthiness of God. It simply has to do uh, with the words he speaks. Can we take him seriously? Does he mean what he says? Will he keep his promises? If I had no text other than the New Testament, it would be conclusive to me that, of course, there are promises that remain for ethnic Israel, not because of favoritism, but because of faithfulness of God. And when Paul wrote to the Romans, because he had never been to Rome, he wanted to make sure they understood the foundational doctrines of the faith. So he took extensive time to lay out the universal sinfulness of Jew and Gentile before God, laid out extensively the principle of justification by faith, 
then laid out extensively our walk in the spirit and overcoming sin, and then laid out extensively the issue of Israel. That's in chapters 9 through 11, because one would have expected that the Jewish people as a whole would have received their Messiah, and that's not what happened, which raised serious questions. So after warning Gentile believers in Romans 11, which interestingly he calls them Gentiles, I'm writing to you Gentiles. He doesn't call them spiritual Jews or Israelites, which would have been the perfect place to do it and put all ambiguity aside. He said, I'm writing to you Gentiles. In his mind, whoops, just knocked a mic over there. I guess I'm so excited about this subject. Uh, he said, I'm, I'm writing to you Gentiles, verse, uh, verse 11 of Romans 11, inasmuch as I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. And he says this, if their trespass, Israel, the nation, which, by the way, outside of Romans 9 through 11, throughout Romans, Paul never speaks of Israel. He speaks of Jews, but he speaks of Israel, speaking clearly of, of Israel's national purposes in Romans 9 through 11. He says that he wants to uh, provoke the Gentiles so that Israel will be made jealous. He said, if their trespass means riches for the world and their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? If their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So he's speaking of yet a future purpose for the nation. And, and then he goes on to put aside any doubt. He says, verse 28, as regards the gospel, they, who, the nation of Israel, are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So once God made promises to the nation, he's never going to take those promises away. And the ultimate mission of Israel, of course, is to bring Messiah into the world. But along the way, God made promises to Israel. And Paul's explicit. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. If he could change his word to Israel, he could change his word to the church, which is why he says in Jeremiah 31, verses 35 to 37, immediately after the promises of the new covenant to Israel and Judah, Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then will I cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. The, the very ongoing existence of the Jewish people to this day is the continued proof from God that he has purposes, that he has not cast us off. And on top of that, when God curses, no one can bless. When God blesses, no one can curse. When he opens the door, no one can shut it. When he shuts, no one can open it. He said he would scatter Israel in his wrath and yet regather them in his mercy. He has actually done that in our day. And there are promises that he gave through the prophets about restoration, return to the land, glory, that have never been completed. Let's also remember that in Genesis 15, when he gave the land promise to Abraham and his descendants, it was only God who passed through the covenantal pieces, indicating that this was a one-way covenant. And Paul writes explicitly to the Galatians that the law, which is roughly 400 years after, cannot annul the promises Psalm 105 says it is for a thousand generations. And Ezekiel 36, which does not reach its fulfillment with the return from Babylonian exile, is one of many Old Testament prophecies, prophecies which has not yet reached its fulfillment. There still must be a return, not because of Israel's repentance, but because of the mercy of God to the glory of God's name. Furthermore, Jesus, in bringing a word of judgment in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, speaking of the desolation that would come upon Israel and his Jewish people, which happened as he prophesied, closes out his words of woe and judgment by saying to Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you welcome me back as Messiah, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As many Matthew commentators recognize, what he's saying is that his return to the earth hinges on Jewish repentance. That's exactly what Peter preached in Acts 3, to Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and to the Jewish people. Repent, turn to God that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah. Furthermore, Peter says in Acts the third chapter that God will fulfill all of the promises that he gave to the people of Israel. And I, I appreciate the the concept of fulfillment versus replacement, but ultimately the result is the same. 
The ultimate result is that those to whom promises were given no longer have promises. And if the fundamental meaning of Scripture can be that radically changed by the revelation that follows, then Jews have every reason to reject that revelation, just like we as followers of Jesus today could reject the revelation that would come and say that there's a further Messiah after Jesus. There's another one. And now the words of the New Testament no longer have meaning. What's also fascinating is that there are explicit prophecies in Scripture like Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14 that have not yet been fulfilled that speak of a national attack on the Jewish people in Jerusalem, or an international attack, I should say, out of which God will deliver, which is part of Israel's final repentance that Paul speaks of, all Israel being saved, not speaking of the accumulation of the remnant there in Romans the 11th chapter, but rather those who have been hardened will turn at the end, as prophesied there in Zechariah 12, that they'll look at him whom they pierced, which then leads to national cleansing and then the ingathering of the nations in Zechariah 14. Jesus himself will come back to that Jerusalem, put his feet down there. These and many other promises to Israel and the Jewish people have not yet been fulfilled. Jeremiah 31 speaks of the day when God will be God to all the families of Israel. And he explicitly says who that means at the end of the chapter. So either we say that God means what he says, or we have to throw out the Bible. To me, it's very simple. Okay, thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, now, we're going to have about 30 minutes of uh, informal conversation, and at any point, feel free to ask each other questions and, you know, go off topic a little bit. But I do want to start off by asking some questions of my own to each of you, and, uh, you know, as you both know, I have a little bit of a dog in this race. I tend to side with Dr. Brown a little bit, but I'm going to try and be as unbiased as possible. And so I want to start with a question to you, Dr. Brown. Um, uh, Steve had mentioned in his opening that in Matthew 2.15, uh, it, it applies Hosea 11.1 1 to Jesus, but, but that was originally a reference to Israel's having been brought out of Egypt. For this and other reasons, it's sometimes said that Jesus is the true Israel, as Steve has pointed out. Do you think that there's any truth to this? And if so, wouldn't that suggest that promises originally made to the people of Israel find their fulfillment, as Steve said, in Christ and in his people? Uh, no, not at all. There's there's truth in that. As it happened to Israel, it will happen to Jesus. As it happened to David, it will happen to Jesus. As it happened to Moses, it will happen to Jesus. You have those types uh, just throughout the New Testament. When when Jesus says, for example, that the one who's lifted his heel against me, uh, his dipped his bread with me, will lift his heel against me, and he's quoting from Psalm 41 about betrayal. Well, that did happen to David. It doesn't void that out that it happened to David. Now, as it happened to David, it will also happen to to Jesus. So Jesus fulfills the purposes of Israel. Absolutely. Jesus is the ultimate true Israel. Absolutely. But the promises that God made to the nation remain. Otherwise, his word can't be taken seriously. And and if someone could come along later and change all the meanings of the Hebrew scriptures, that's one of the ways that the Jewish people were supposed to test whether the person was the Messiah or not, as Deuteronomy 13 lays out with regard to someone claiming to speak for God. Steve, uh, uh, I want to put this to you then, because I, I tend to agree with Dr. Brown a little bit that one of the reasons uh, that I remain convinced that there are promises yet to be fulfilled in Israel is because, like Dr. Brown said, it seems as though when we say that the promises God originally made to a particular group of people are completely changed in terms of you know the audience that fulfills them, it, it seems to make God out to be far less trustworthy uh, than he would otherwise be. H how do you respond to the way that Dr. Brown responded to my question? Well, I don't actually believe that the recipients of the promises have ever changed. I believe that when you look at what God said in the Old Testament, he made it very clear that those in Israel that honor him, he will honor. Those who are in Israel who don't honor him, he will not honor, which means there was a remnant that these promises apply to. He will honor the remnant who are faithful to him. This is certainly in the Old Testament in Psalm chapter 50 where in verse 5 it says, Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. This is God speaking of the remnant. But a few verses later, in verse 16 he says, But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth? Implying they don't have any right to. They are wicked. They, they are taking God's covenant in their mouth, but they're wicked. They have no right to it. God's saying, My covenant is not to the wicked. My covenant is to those who are faithful. And that's what Paul points out in the olive tree illustration in Romans 11, which defines who Israel is. Uh, you know, the olive tree with the branches broken off is Jeremiah's picture from Jeremiah 11:16. 16. 
Jeremiah said that Israel or Judah was like a, a green olive tree with some branches broken off. Paul picks that up and says, well, yeah, there's branches broken off now off of Israel because of their unbelief. And there's Gentiles who've been grafted in and have partaken of the root and the fatness of the tree. In other words, those Gentiles that are now grafted in, they're part of Israel now. The olive tree is Israel. That's, a, that's an established symbol of Israel, the olive tree. And he says, now, those who are unbelievers who reject Christ, they're not part of the olive tree anymore. They're not part of Israel. But Gentiles are. And in this way, he says in verse 26, all Israel will be saved. That is, the Jewish and the Gentile branches of the Israel tree will be saved in this way, by God including those who have faith in Christ and rejecting those who don't. Now, this is not a change from the Old Testament. The Old Testament, God opened the earth to swallow up Korah and his rebellious group. They were certainly Israelites. Uh, they weren't chosen. They weren't uh, godly. They weren't blessed. Uh, in Israel, the promises were always conditional. Even when he, even when he made his first covenant with them he, at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, God said, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you will be a peculiar treasure unto me above all yeah. the nations. So, so it's always been conditional, and it still is. And the conditions in the Old Testament were the Israelites who followed God and his prophets were true Israel, and the others were rejected. Then comes Messiah. God hasn't changed. Those who follow Messiah are true Israel. Those who don't are not. Yeah, the, the, the big problems with that is that Scripture is against it. You see, the fact that God blessed obedient ones within Israel did not void out the promises he gave to the nation as a whole. That's why he's preserved the Jewish people to this very day, as he promised he would. Who has he preserved? Only the believers know. If the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then will I cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done. So despite Israel's sin, he continues to preserve us as a people. If we die outside of Jesus, we're lost forever. That hasn't changed. But it's so striking that in, in Genesis 15, it's not conditional. God alone passes through the pieces. Abraham, who's Abram then, does not. And certainly, you know, from Jeremiah 34, the, the covenant of the pieces in ancient Near Eastern uh, tradition, you, both, know, parties yeah. would, both parties would pass through. But let me go further with this. When God said he would scatter Israel and regather them, he was going to scatter and regather because of his purposes, not because of their faith or their, or, or, or their, their goodness. He was going to scatter them in judgment and regather them in his mercy. So who did he scatter? Unbelievers. Who did he regather? Unbelievers, as he says in Ezekiel 36. It's not, it's not for your sake, it's for my name. When we come to, to Romans 11, there couldn't be a, a, a wronger exegesis of the passages as, as, as we know, just reading through ten times in Romans, Paul in Romans nine through eleven, Paul explicitly speaks about Israel as the nation as a whole. And what's his whole point? Has God utterly cast them off? No, no, no. Who's who is the them? The unbelievers, the non-believers. And he says, "I'm writing to you, Gentiles." He doesn't call them Israelites. He doesn't call them spiritual Jews. He calls okay. them Dr. Ryan, Gentiles. There. And, and let, me, let, let me let me just finish though, because you made a bunch of points. I'd like to respond. At when we go through, right up through Romans 11.25, the ones who have been hardened, that's not talking about the remnant, that's not talking about Gentiles, the ones who have been hardened are the ones who will be saved. And then he makes it explicit. They, right now, who? Unbelieving Jews are the enemies, your enemies, because of the gospel. But they still have promises. Why? Because of God's unconditional love to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the gifts and calling of God to them, who the nation as a whole are irrevocable. It's the plain sense of Scripture. We can't get away from that. Well, let, ahead, let me jump in if I can, because you made the same points just now that you made in your presentation. I wished I could have answered them then. Maybe I could have a chance to answer some of them now as extremely briefly. Jeremiah 31 uh, you know, if God's going to abandon the sun, moon, and stars, he'll also abandon all the remnant of Israel, all the nation of Israel. I don't believe he's abandoned all the nation of Israel. I believe that, as Paul said, God hasn't cast off his people whom he foreknew. I, he, Paul says, I'm an Israelite myself. God did, Is God that what it says? Israel off. will cease from being a nation. That's what it says in the text, okay, verse 36. But, but the nation is not ethnic. Uh, in in First Peter two, so, so then you're, you're making ten, void the Steve hold, hold in all candor. Well, no, let me let me have a chance to speak. But, but you're no, making no, void scripture. It's really important here. It's really important. No, I, if you can just void. twist. I will not make it void. Just let me speak if I could. Uh, Peter said to us that we are a holy nation, a, a chosen generation to the church. Now that's not a political or an ethnic group. 
It's a nation, though, Peter said. And God has not cast off all Israel, that they should be not, not a nation. He has included Gentiles in them. He has not cast off Israel. He, he has preserved the remnant as he said he would. And he has added to them Gentiles who believe. Now, you mentioned the twice the sacrifice uh, or the... This, the covenant God made with Abraham and the, and the you know, oven or the torch passing through the pieces. Yes, I agree with you. It's an unconditional covenant God made that he would fulfill promises to Abraham. And Paul, who is like the inspired apostle of Jesus Christ, tells us, uh, as you know, know very well, Galatians 3.16, he says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now that would be, of course, the promises God made even on the occasion you've just described. And he says, he does not say to seeds, as of many, but to your seed, which is Christ. Now, I don't see how Paul could be any plainer. We talk about the plain sense of Scripture. How could it be plainer that Paul is saying the promises made to Abraham were not to Abraham and his plural seeds, but to his singular seed, Christ? And so that's, I, I take Paul at his word. And so now, he understands, yeah, the, he understands the, the problem. The, the problem is, though, the problem is that, that you are now introducing things that make void the original intent of Scripture to the recipients, which makes us then have to say, how can we believe Paul and Peter are accurate telling us the truth? That's the big problem. And by the way, I didn't get to respond to, to all the points you made initially because you gave your opening statement, I gave mine. Uh, occasionally it intersected, but mine was not a rebuttal of yours. So we, we both have, I've got about <laughs> three hours of things I'd like to say in response to your opening points. But, but just, just back to this. When God said when God made promises to Jeremiah, to a, a physical people, and then when he said, I will scatter that people, and I will regather that people, we know who he's talking about. To say this now applies to the church makes the word of God void. We might as well say, because Muhammad has come after Jesus, that the church is now Islam, and Islam fulfills those purposes. Also, anyone who knows Hebrew knows that when Paul is saying seeds is one, it's a midrash there, because the, the, the Hebrew word seed is often collective. Everyone knows that. Every scholar of of Hebrew and Galatians understands it, or just a first grade Hebrew person understands it. He's making a Madrashic point. Peter Even reiterates, Peter reiterates in Acts the third chapter that the promise, all the promises that God gave to the prophets will be fulfilled. It, it doesn't, they, they don't get voided out or they don't get now transferred over. And in, in point of fact, the physical land promise that comes in Genesis 15 was never explicitly given to Gentile believers. In point of fact, when, when, when Paul is talking about the promises that were given to Abraham, he's talking about that through his seed, the entire world would be blessed. Those spiritual promises. When we come back to Romans 11, there's no possible way to get out of what Paul's saying in Romans 11, 28 and 29, which is why I reiterate those, those passages. The ones who are now the enemies are the ones that still have covenant promises. That's why we're here. That's why we have been regathered. We didn't regather ourselves. We don't have the power to. If God cursed us and scattered us in his judgment, we don't have the power to regather ourselves. We have been preserved. We have been regathered because of God's eternal purposes. We have, there is no ethnic higher or lower to, to imply that because God keeps his word that makes him a racist is, is very offensive to me, actually. I, I think it's a charged word that ought not to be used whatsoever. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile and standing before God. The same God is rich in mercy to all who call upon him. We're all lost without Jesus and making Jesus known is the ultimate issue, period. Yet God made promises and the promises remain. And Israel remains a physical sign and witness in the earth. Therefore, the world hatred against Israel and the Jewish people. Therefore, the world hostility against Jerusalem, because God's purposes are still being worked out in front of the entire world. OK, let me step in for a moment. Uh, because obviously there's a ton of stuff I'm sure each of you would like to respond to, but there's something that I still think needs answering. You know, Steve had mentioned that Peter calls his readers a holy nation and a, and a, and a chosen race. I happen to think, and I think many commentators would agree, that Peter was writing to a, a Jewish audience. Uh, however, in Romans 11, Paul does seem to say that Jews were uh, broken off of a tree that allegedly represents Israel and that Gentiles were grafted in. Uh, Dr. Brown... It doesn't seem to me that Steve is saying that promises have been voided or, sh or, or changed, you know, that they've been applied to somebody else, but rather that the promises that were made to Israel are promises into which Gentiles have been grafted. It, they've been grafted into Israel. How do you see the grafting of these branches, of the Gentile branches, into the tree? 
they've been grafted into the family of God. They've been grafted into the the patriarchal promises. Uh, they don't become Israel, and that's why uh, that's why Peter never explicitly says Israel. That's why it's a misinterpretation of Galatians six sixteen, as most major translations would recognize to say that Gentile believers are the new Israel. So there's inclusion in the family of God. We are all sons. We are all uh, spiritual royalty. Many of the things that have been spoken, even the, the spiritual circumcision can be spoken. And yet Paul and others stop short of saying that Gentile believers are now Israel. And again, Paul makes it explicit. He says, I, I am writing to you Gentiles because I want to provoke Israel to jealousy. Who's he talking about? He's talking about unbelieving Israel, and he calls them Israel as he does over and over. After saying in Romans 9, 6 that there's an Israel within Israel, which is not talking about Gentiles, it's talking about the Jewish remnant within Israel. Now, ten times thereafter, he speaks of Israel in Romans 9, 10, 11, and every single time he's speaking of the nation as a whole. So, yes, there are promises that are given. Yes, we are joint heirs in Jesus, but there are promises that remain that we're giving to the nation as a whole. That's the nation who's been preserved. That's the people who is hardened right now. Those are the ones who are enemies of the gospel right now. And yet, beloved, for the sake of the fathers, because the gifts and calling God to who? To the nation as a whole are irrevocable. Now, uh, Steve, uh, you know, I, I, it strikes me that the word Israel does typically refer to the nation of Israel in the New Testament. But but regarding Romans 11, there's a further point that I'd like you to respond to in addition to responding to what Dr. Brown just said. And that's that Paul asks this rhetorical question. He asks if Israel has fallen beyond recovery, as some translations, I believe, put it. Uh, and, then he, and then he says that their, whereas their, their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, their acceptance will bring life from the dead. He, said, he says, no, they didn't stumble so as to fall without recovery, but rather that a partial hardening has happened until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so that all Israel will be saved. Steve, what does all Israel will be saved mean, when, if it means what you say it is, if it's an answer to the question, has Israel fallen by, beyond recovery? It's not the answer to that question. It's not found in the same verse or in the same context. It's in the same chapter, but it's not the answer to that question. I believe that when Paul says all Israel shall be saved, of course he begins that with the word thus. Thus which means, in this way, all Israel will be saved. Uh, so he has just described how all Israel will be saved. There, there, is, there are promises in the Old Testament that Israel will be saved in Yahweh. And Paul is explaining how that is true. He begins in Romans 9 and says, you know, it may look like the promises of God have fallen to the ground that because Israel hasn't apparently been saved. He said, but it's not that, it, that the promises of God have not taken effect. They, in fact, have been fulfilled, but not all are Israel who are of Israel. God has in fact fulfilled the promises to Israel. You just have to define Israel the way God does and the way that Paul does. And, uh, and so he explains, Israel is this olive tree. The believing Israelites who have believed in Christ are remaining branches on the tree. Unbelieving Israelites have been removed from the tree, and Gentiles who believe have been added. And in this way, all Israel is saved. God has blinded some of Israelites. In part, they've been blinded. And the Gentiles are coming in in a, uh, in a fullness uh, of Gentiles. And he says, in this way, all Israel is being saved, is to be saved. Now, I haven't had a chance to answer most of Dr. Brown's points because I haven't had very much opportunity to speak. And that's all right. I don't expect that we will have time to cover all the points. And I, I seriously doubt that Dr. Brown has the time to listen to my lectures online about Israel, about Romans 9 through 11, or about much of these things. But I just want to summarize that I believe that the promises God made to Israel have been fulfilled. And uh, I believe God is faithful. Therefore, like Dr. Brown, my concern is that God's faithfulness be affirmed in this matter. The Bible says that God has fulfilled the promises to Israel in Christ. It says it many times. Now, about Israel being scattered and regathered, there are predictions about both of those things, and they were fulfilled. In fact, they were fulfilled before Jesus came to earth. God scattered them into Babylon and many nations, and he regathered them from there, as he promised he would. After he regathered them, he did not make further promises about that. And the New Testament, interestingly, doesn't make any promises about it either. It seems to me that if Israel has such an important eschatological purpose, it's amazing that the entire New Testament could avoid mentioning anything about it, with the possible exception of Romans 11.26, which isn't necessarily saying anything about land, or a nation. He says all Israel will be saved, and even if we would allow Israel there to mean ethnic Israel, that's fine with me, 
let them be saved. But that has nothing to do with land, has nothing to do with the nation. And I'm not against the nation of Israel. I'm not against them having the land. All I'm saying is I don't see this as a fulfillment of anything in the Old Testament. I believe that salvation is in Christ. It's not in the land of Israel. Uh, you know what's interesting, Steve, is, is I have the same perception you do, is that I'm not getting to speak much. So that's, <laughs> that's how it goes in a good debate. But, but number one, you, in all, I know you're not doing this to win a debate. I'm 100% sure of that. I, I trust you on that level. But I feel you're throwing out red herrings. No one said salvation's in the land, number one. And number two, I never brought the land issue in with Romans 11.26. So let, let's be clear on that. But let, let, let me just very quickly respond. The glorious regathering that was spoken of in the prophets, Jeremiah 30 to 33, uh, Ezekiel 36, many of the passages in Isaiah, that was never fulfilled. That, that never happened. There was a partial regathering that never had the full glory promise. Those promises remain to be fulfilled. And again, the God who scattered is the God who regathered. Now, Jesus makes the same point, Luke, the 21st chapter, that Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. It's not a coincidence that Jerusalem was out of Jewish hands for almost 2,000 years, and now for the first time it's back. Jesus said there would be an until, and we're seeing that come to pass. And you didn't have to say much about the land at that time because Israel was still established in the land then. When we get back to Romans, though, Romans 9.27, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sands of the sea, twice in Romans 9.27 he speaks of Israel. Who's he talking about? The nation as a whole. Romans 9.31 Israel pursued a law that would lead to righteousness. They, they didn't find it. They went the wrong way. They didn't go by faith. 931, 1019, 1021, 11, 2, 11, 7, 11, 11, and 11.25, he's speaking about the nation as a whole. Israel who is hardened until the full, fullness of the Gentiles comes in. In this way, how? Through the fullness of the Gentiles coming in, which he still calls Gentiles there. This now provokes Israel to jealousy. And in this way, on the heels of this, Romans 11, 26, all Israel will be saved. Who's all Israel? The Israel that has been hardened. And then again, we still come to 11, 28, and 29, which, which I stay with because it hasn't, hasn't been addressed yet, which says explicitly that this people, that right now they are enemies of God. Let's not even think of the land. Let's put the land out, out of the equation right now. And let's recognize that no one is saved outside of Jesus and that to my great pain and grief, many of my Jewish people die every day without Jesus and are lost. All right, there's no favoritism in God, no favoritism. However, the ones who are currently the enemies, those are the ones that Paul says are still loved because God made promises. And that's the only reason we're here. And that's why there are prophecies that speak of Jerusalem in the future, inhabited by Jews, and a world attack against it, Zechariah 12, which which by all fair interpretation has to be speaking of a future event, as does Zechariah 14. In fact, Acts 1 reiterates it, that, that the Mount of Olives from which Jesus left, he will return there, and we see at that time that God will deliver Israel, and somehow, I don't know how many Jewish people will be left at that time, somehow there will be a national turning in the purposes and plans of God. And, and the bigger thing to me, Steve, and, and by the way, I've never I hinted or thought that you were anti-Israel today or against the land. I, don't, I, I didn't hear that in anything that you said. But the biggest thing to me is not even the land promise. Uh, the biggest thing to me is the, the, the national promise that there will be a turning. And that's what we must be jealous for. And interestingly, the, the idea that the gospel is to the Jew first is also found in Romans 2, where judgment is to the Jew first. That's a future thing still. And Paul says that this is how it's going to be in the future. Judgment to Israel first and judgment to Gentiles second, but salvation offered to Israel first on an ongoing basis and to Gentiles as well. Okay, Steve, I'm sure there's a lot you'd like to respond to there. Go ahead and respond. <laughs> Well, I'd like to, of course, respond to everything, but I won't have the opportunity to do so. Um, I, I just want to say that I don't believe that it can be said that by any reasonable interpretation, Zechariah 12 and 14 have to be future. I have uh, taught through the book of Zechariah verse by verse over 20 times in different schools, and I certainly do not see it necessary to apply them to the future. I believe they apply very well to things that have already been fulfilled and which are identified for us in the New Testament as fulfilled by the very quotations from those passages. Uh, and I think that's true of essentially, see this is, I was a dispensationalist uh, 
in my upbringing, and I became a believer as in what I now believe, not because I ever read uh, you know a non dispensationalist book, but because I read uh, the Bible. I was fully persuaded of, frankly, everything that Dr. Brown is saying about Israel. Uh, but what I did is I saw how the New Testament writers, who I am told in Scripture Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures, I take that to mean the Old Testament Scriptures, they quoted from many of the same passages that I would have used to make Dr. Brown's points. And they quoted them as, as being fulfilled in the church. It was, in fact, it was a commonplace. It was not just one or two times. It was essentially the standard way that they interpreted those kinds of passages. And that really kind of surprised me when I began. And then I began to understand the argument of Romans 9 through 11 differently. Because I thought that Romans 9 through 11 was saying God has postponed his fulfillment of the promises and that's why it does not appear that all Israel is saved, because God's going to do that later. Then I found, as I read through Romans 9 through 11, Paul said, no, God has not postponed it. He has fulfilled it to the true Israel, which is, of course, the remnant within the national Israel, as well as Gentile branches that have been broken off, now are, are added on because of faith. Now, Dr. Brown has pointed out many times that throughout Romans 9 through 11, the, the word Israel is used in contrast to Gentiles. That is entirely true. There's no question about that. Paul is trying to talk to a church that is mixed Jew and Gentile, and which I believe there's evidence there's racial hostilities between them. And I believe that he's addressing the Gentile element sometimes and the Jewish element sometimes and trying to point out to them what their relationship is with each other in the New Covenant. I believe Romans throughout the book from chapter 1 on is basically addressing a tension that existed in the Roman church between the Jewish element and the Gentile element. And I believe he's doing so in Romans 9 through 11 as well. So, of course, he says, now you Gentiles, now you Israel. Now, and, but, but see, when Dr. Brown see, sees Paul saying Israel, he's taking it to mean the nation of Israel. Why would that be? The other group he talks to are the Gentiles. That's an ethnic designation, not, not a national thing. Uh, he's talking about ethnic Jews need to see certain things certain ways, and ethnic Gentiles need to see certain things certain ways. And basically, I believe, in using different terminology with the olive tree, he's making the same point he makes in Ephesians 2, that God took the Jew and the Gentile, he broke down the middle wall of partition between them, in Christ he made one new man, or okay. one new olive tree, we could say. But Steve, let me step in for a second, because one thing that I, I don't think I've heard you respond to is, is Dr. Brown's mentioning that at the beginning of that chapter in, in uh, 9 or 10 or 11, I forget which one, uh, he talks about the unbelieving Jews as enemies in the present tense and yet says that the God's promises to them uh, are irrevocable. H how do you respond to that? Yeah. In, in a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, he doesn't say his promises to them specifically. Uh, God, all of God's promises, uh, frankly, are conditional, but they're not revocable. Uh, when God has a promise that he makes, or it says, the, actually it doesn't say promise, it says the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. The gifts and callings of God, if you look in Romans chapter 9, he says these promises are not just to the Jew only, but the, all who are called to the Jew and also to the Greek. Uh, you'll find he says that, we're the vessels of honor, all who are called, uh, Jew and Gentile. So the callings of God don't include only the Jews in Paul's thinking, they include all the faithful all who are faithful to Christ. And God has, in other words, has not revoked his promises. He has fulfilled them. And yes, okay. if, if, if I could, if I could just uh, uh, jump in, uh, two things. I, I, of course, I differ with the Zechariah comment in terms of legitimate interpretation. So we, we, we differ there, but I, I respect the fact you've gone through things. And I, I was a dispensationalist the first five years of my believing life and haven't been ever since and entertained amillennialism, postmillennialism, various interpretations, entertain uh, in depth what you hold to and read much in it and, and really tried to go that way, but was convinced by Scripture it couldn't. But but you really misrepresented, again, who Paul's speaking about in, in Romans 9, 10, 11. The times when he says Israel, twice in 9, 27, then 9, 31, 10, 19, 10, 21, 11, 2, 11, 7, 11, 11, 11, 25, He's talking about the unbelieving nation as a whole. Just read him in context. He's praying for them. They are the ones who reject it, and there's a remnant among them, who the, the unbelieving nation. And, and what he says explicitly then, Romans 11, 28, as regards the gospel, they, who? Non-believing Israel, the non-believing Jews, as regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they, who? Non-believing Jews, nation of Israel, they 
our beloved for the sake of the forefathers. And I'll say dogmatically, there's no possible way to separate the they from 1128A from 1128B. Why? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Look, even if God, as some of the church leaders believe, preserved Israel under judgment to demonstrate something to the world, the fact remains that he made promises to the nation as a whole because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why we have been scattered. That's why we have been preserved. That's why we have been regathered. And there, there is no possible way to separate the they who are the enemies of God from the they who are beloved. And to be in harmony with Scripture, that means you must say of the entire nation and all unbelieving Jews that although they may be cut off and although they may be enemies of the gospel, they, because of election, are still beloved for the sake of the forefathers because God made those promises and his gifts and his calling are irrevocable. Okay, let me let me say let me address that verse because you've brought it up several times and apparently you're waiting for me to address it. The only reason I haven't yet is because I thought there were more important things to, to address first. But when Paul says concerning the gospel, they are enemies. Of course, the they are is in italics. It's not in the Greek. It just says as uh, concerning the gospel, enemies for your sake. But it says concerning the election, beloved. The they are is not in either clause in the Greek. But nonetheless, he makes, I think he speaks of two groups. He talks about the those who are enemies on the one hand, and he speaks about the election, a term that he used earlier in the chapter in verse 6 when he distinguished between the nation as a whole and the elect within it. Uh, or it was not verse 6, but uh, yeah, I believe it was verse 6, wasn't it? Chapter 11, uh, even so, uh, he says, by grace... Uh, actually, it's not verse 11. It's a little later on. He talks about how uh, Israel has not obtained what it sought, but the election have received it. I thought it was verse 6. I'm looking for it now, but I'm on the fly. I can't, can't look at that verse. It's verse 7. Uh, Romans 11:7. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the election. In the Greek, the same word, I believe, as you find in verse 28. The election referred to the remnant within Israel. Israel hasn't found it, but the election have. And then he says, they, presumably the nation, are enemies, but as concerned the election, they are beloved. Uh, I'm not sure that we can say that the two groups in verse 20 are the same people any more than the two groups are in verse 7, where the election is also mentioned. I think there could be a distinction being made there. Okay, now I'm sure you want to respond to that, Dr. Brown, but the 30 minutes uh, is over and you're running out of time, I'm sure. So you have five minutes for your closing statement, in which I'm sure you could respond to that, and then we'll let Steve close things off. Sure thing. Let me just look at my clock here. And by the way, Steve, it's an absolute delight to me to have these differences and talk them through, and for both of us to be passionate. I'm, I'm delighted to have the opportunity, and I appreciate your your attention to Scripture and attention to uh to interact with me. So thanks for the time. And of course, our differences are sharpened through this, but thanks for doing it. Okay, I'll, I'll click my, my watch here. Really, I think what was just underscored in the closing comments of, of Steve about Romans 11 is, is just how impossible it is to make these separations. And it's almost like what church exegesis has done through the years. They will be scattered, the Jews. But they will be regathered. The church. No, no, we, we can't do that. And it, what's so fascinating is the very point that I've been emphasizing is when Paul says Israel, he means the nation as a whole in Romans 9 through 11. After initially establishing there's an Israel within Israel, even from the verse we just saw, Romans 11, 7, what then Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking? Who's he talking about? He's talking about the nation as a whole. Through their trespass, who's? The nation as a whole. Salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. And then he culminates his passage by saying, Lest you, Gentiles, be wise in your own sight, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon who? Israel. Nation as a whole. Unbelieving. They're the ones upon whom the hardness has come until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel, who? Israel, the one who has been hardened the one who has missed it, the one who has sinned, they are the ones who will turn. And that's his whole point. The the reason Paul now has to emphasize his point about they, Israel, are beloved for the sake of the forefathers. And of course, understood in the Greek, which is why it's there in virtually every translation. 
is because the, the, the church made the same error back then. Paul warns against it. says, don't think that because you are the new kids on the block that God is finished with the nation of Israel as a whole. God forbid. In fact, he says that repeatedly. Absolutely not. They didn't stumble in order that they might fall. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. And as the Gentiles, by the fullness of the Spirit, and the great harvest, make Israel envious, Israel turns to the Lord, and God's glorious purposes are wonderfully fulfilled. The fact remains that he who scattered, regathered, and many of the regathering promises were never fulfilled. And the only way the Jewish people are regathered today, the only reason that we have been preserved today, the only reason we're back in the land today is because God has regathered us. We do not have the power to unscatter what God has gathered. And Jesus himself spoke about this, the destruction of Jerusalem, the scattering of the Jewish people, Jerusalem being in Gentile hands until the times of the Gentiles have been fulfilled. Something happened. It's no longer in Gentile hands. It's back in Jewish hands. That must mean that these things are coming to pass. And ultimately, I think it's important that we emphasize that this has nothing to do, sorry for a phone ringing in the background. I, I prayed that if I was right, the phone would ring twice during this broadcast. Just, <laughs> just, just kidding, but, but I apologize. I didn't realize it could ring in this room here. All right. The, the, the point is, this comes down to the faithfulness of God. How do I know? that God will keep his promises to the church as a whole because he's kept his promises to Israel to this very day. How how can I have hope and confidence that there will not be a casting off of the church ultimately because of the faithfulness of God to Israel and to the Jewish people? And I know some call things fulfillment theology versus replacement theology, but the end result is the same. The end result is the same, that millions of Jews around the world have no promises that were given to them in the Old Testament because now they apply to someone else, whether someone else took them or God switched them. In that case, he can't be trusted. And when he made promises in Jeremiah 31 that he would be the God of all the families of Israel at that time, he was speaking to physical people. And if if any of the prophets could have understood that all these words of covenant faithfulness and covenant promise, even in Isaiah 62, that God's purpose is ultimately for Jerusalem to be a praise for the whole earth, not because of Jewishness, but because of Jesus being in the midst of his Jewish people. If the prophets could have known, if Abraham could have known that all these words spoken to him and his descendants, if Isaiah could have known in Jeremiah, that they would have no more meaning, no more uh, application to their own people. Those people would be like everybody else, and instead it would refer now exclusively to believers in Jesus. They would have been shocked. They would have said, absolutely not. Of course everything comes through the Messiah, but that does not negate all the other promises God has made. It has to do with the faithfulness of God. If we look at it through racial, ethnic lines, we miss the point. It's 100% a matter of the trustworthiness of God and of the plain sense of Scripture. And that's what we have to hold to. Okay, thank you, Dr. Brown. And now, Steve, you can close us off with your five-minute closing statement. Okay. I think Dr. Brown doesn't understand the position I've been arguing here. When he said, if Abraham... Uh, had known that this wouldn't, the promises wouldn't apply to his people, he would have been shocked. Actually, uh, I think Abraham did know that the promises did not apply to a great number of his people. They did not apply to Edomites or Ishmaelites or many others descended from Abraham. They knew, I think Abraham knew that the promises apply only to a remnant of those who are descended from him, and they would be the ones through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, And even only a remnant of them, Moses knew it, David knew it, the prophets knew it, that only a remnant would be saved. You see, if God has to bring all Israel around to Christ in the end in order to be faithful to the Jews, then he's been very unfaithful to those Jews who've died and been lost because they had the same promises made. He has made promises and fulfilled them. He promised Israel he would send a Messiah. He did so. He promised he would save those who would put their faith in him. He did so. Those who have the faith of Abraham are saved, just like Abraham was. God hasn't cast off any one group of people in favor of another group of people. He has fulfilled his promises just as he made them, and not differently than he made them. He made promises to those who would believe in him. Those who honor him, he will honor. Those who despise him are lightly esteemed, he said. That's a statement he made multiple times in the Old Testament. To say that just because people are ethnic Israel, 
somehow they have special promises made to them is to deny what the Old Testament itself says in places like that. The Old Testament acknowledges that many Jews were not believers and were lost, and many Gentiles too. But in the Old Testament, also many Gentiles, or at least some, came to faith, people like Ruth and Rahab and others. In other words, Israel in the Old Testament, even then, was simply made up of those who have faith. A Jew could be cut off from the people by being an idolater or a murderer. He wouldn't be part of Israel anymore. He's cut off from his people. But a Gentile could be grafted in, even in the Old Testament, could become a proselyte. In other words, Israel in the Old Testament was never strictly a racial designation. It was always those who were faithful to the covenant are Israel. Those who are unfaithful are cut off from the people. Israel is not defined ethnically. It is defined covenantally. And now there's a new covenant. And the old covenant has been abolished. So says the writer of Hebrews. Where there's a new covenant, the old is obsolete. Okay, so God now deals with people according to a new covenant. And Israel is still defined in terms of covenant faithfulness. Fortunately, many hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Jewish people have come into that covenant and have found the fulfillment of the promises that God made to their people. They have also found, in fulfillment of those, of those same promises, that they have entered into it with a lot of people who are not Jewish, who also have come into Christ and who have enjoyed the benefits of the Jewish Messiah. Now, I think Dr. Brown and I agree on most of that. I'm not sure why it doesn't reach the same conclusions from that as I do, but, but the, uh, the issues of the land we didn't discuss very much. Certainly God made conditional promises about land, conditional promises about them being his people, always conditions. Certainly if one reads Exodus 19, 5 and 6, he says, if you keep my covenant, if you obey my voice, then you will be my peculiar people. Well, that's a, that's a big if. And uh, likewise, he said, if, you know, if they don't keep his covenant, they'll be driven from the land. Again, I have no problem at all with Israel being in the land. I just don't think that they can make uh, a claim based on Old Testament promises that were conditional if they're not currently meeting the conditions. I don't think they can claim a sp specific divine mandate to it any more than we who live in this land can claim a divine mandate for being in this land. I don't think that God gives away uh, real estate specifically to groups anymore because I believe the land of Israel was a type and a shadow as the nation of Israel was a type and a shadow of how the meek shall inherit the earth. That, that Jesus will inherit the earth. God is going to give him the ends of the earth of his inheritance, for his inheritance. And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and you are heirs according to the promise. And I am in Christ. I'm not a Jew, but I'm in Christ. And therefore, I didn't make this up. This is not some kind of arrogance on my part. I'm just trying to be faithful to the scripture. Paul says, if you're in Christ, you are Abraham's seed. Okay, well, then I am. You are heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promises he made to Abraham. Okay, I'll buy that. Not because I have anything against the Jews, but because I have something in favor of believing what the New Testament teaches. And so that's my position. Uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises that God made to Israel. And they are fulfilled in him. He didn't change them. He fulfilled them. That's the position that I take. All right, well, I want to thank you both so very much for your time today. I know that all of us have, you know, hours worth of things that we'd like to say, uh, and uh, unfortunately we didn't have that time, but I do appreciate the amount of time that you both were able to give me today. Thanks so much. Thank you. And, and Steve, maybe we could uh, carry this out on one another's radio shows in the future and, and each take these sides a bit more fully. But thank you for your time, Steve, and for a great job, Chris. That's really, Dr. Brown. We can be on my show and maybe on yours too. Well, there you have it. That was Dr. Michael Brown and Steve Gregg on the future of Israel. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll enjoy next week's episode, which, Lord willing, will be Steve Jeffrey uh, on post-millennialism. Until then.